Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in and watching this interview as we talk about different topics of philosophy. And I am leaning heavily on experts who have dedicated a lot of time and work and study uh, to learn about philosophy. My guest for this interview, a second interview I've done with Dr. Robert Howell, he serves as the chair of the Department of Philosophy at Southern Methodist University. And so thank you for coming back or remaining <laughs> and not running away after the first one. I Thanks first so much. You, didn't, you haven't scared me away yet. <laughs> well, the, the night is young, right? A uh, little bit more about yourself. When you're not reading philosophy, what, what do you like to read? Who are your favorite authors or the types of literature? Well, so I kind of alternate between um, – I guess capital L literature, I'm a, and which I'm a big fan of people like Cormac McCarthy, um, uh, but I also like some of the old classics like even Joyce and things like that. But um, one of my standbys is detective fiction. I'm a, I'm a huge mystery fiction, detective fiction fan, so almost at all times I've got some detective fiction in my back pocket. There's just something about, you know, there's just, you know, there's a crime. It's going to get solved. <laughs> As a philosopher who oftentimes has these open-ended questions, there's something really happy about getting a good solution at the end of a detective yeah. novel. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned Joyce. Uh, I married an Irish woman uh -huh. in Ireland. And I remember when I was over there getting married uh, 18 years ago, I saw James Joyce, Ulysses, or, you know, I think it was a portrait of an, of an artist as a young man or something. And I thought it was so cool to be reading Joyce in Ireland, you know, about to marry an Irish woman. I just, but yeah, he, he's great. He's yeah. certainly one of the best authors of the 20th century. Yeah, he's amazing. Uh, so, um, all right, well, let's get right to it. In this interview, we're going to talk about the mind-body problem, starting with Descartes. So uh, I guess right off the bat, what's the mind-body problem? What does that mean? Well, so um, in general, one way to put it is it looks as though we nowadays at least have a fairly good grasp of the idea that a lot of what's going on, you know, mentally has to do with the brain. Yeah. Um, so that shouldn't be that surprising uh, to many of us. If you get knocked on the head, things change in your mind. Um, and the more we learn about the mind through things like fMRIs, the more we learn that there's pretty good correspondence between brain activity and mental activity. Um, that being said, it does seem as though, to some of us, um, that there are features of our mental life that can't clearly be explained or captured by, let's say, a neural description of ourselves or a physical description of ourselves. Um, there seems to be something to mentality that looks like it's sort of over and above the various pushings and pullings and pulsings of brains and physical things. Um, and the mind-body problem is basically an attempt to sort of say, okay, what, what is the relation between um, these sorts of notions of mentality that we have and the physical world and the, and the brain? Uh, and if there is something non-physical, like a soul, what is the relationship between the soul and the brain and how do they interact? Um, if there's not, then how in the world does a brain do all this stuff that we think that we have? Yeah, yeah. I know Aquinas talked about the subsistence of the rational soul, which if you're going to believe in, I guess, an afterlife or, you know, the, the you know, where somebody who has died, where are they now? Or are they just, did they just rot and they're, they're done? Because it really does tie in a lot to uh, religion and belief in an afterlife and that kind of thing to talk about this mind-body relationship, right? Yeah, I mean, so you don't have to be religious to actually be interested in it. Um, uh, so a lot of the people who are, you know, really interested in it today, I would say, aren't particularly religious necessarily. But if you have a belief in an afterlife, which, of course, a lot of people do, um, then you've got a position on the mind-body problem. You presumably believe that your mind's going to be in the afterlife mm -hmm. um, and your body's not there. So you believe in a separation of the mind and the body. Um, and so that's that's a position on a fairly substantial philosophical issue that a lot of us sort of just inherit with our belief systems. And what philosophers want to do is they want to kind of take a closer look at that. We spent in the last interview a lot of time talking about Rene Descartes, who um, was uh, died in 1650, 17th century French philosopher. I think therefore I am. This is a starting point with this as well. Did this, uh, not that, I mean, mind, body, Aristotle and Plato and you know, Augustine and Aquinas, they all talked about this, but was there something revolutionary that happened in this discussion with Descartes? Well, so, I mean, I think that modern philosophy has thought that. I think that there's an awful lot of people who are experts about classical philosophy who will say a lot of these arguments that are in Descartes you can actually find in uh in Aristotle or Plato or Augustine, 
Um, and I, I actually am somebody who believes that. I think that you can find a lot of these arguments back in Plato. Um, but I'd say that the contemporary mind-body problem um, sort of owes a little bit more to Descartes and the way he presented the puzzle. So even though it's been around for really as long as people have been thinking about minds at all, um, it's, I think, sort of gotten, gotten a particular sort of edge um, mm-hmm. maybe since Descartes. Yeah, and also, uh, you know, I know Plato tended to, uh, as maybe denigrate may not be the right word, but the, the, the physical world was not as important to Plato as it was to Aristotle, you know, the universal forms. It, with Descartes, when he says, I think, therefore I am, is he implying that I don't really need the body, that I, I really the most reliable thing and the thing that's most important to me is my mind, and so the body is just kind of an accessory that I lug around? or Because that's a platonic type of attitude. Would Descartes have subscribed to that? Well, I mean, so in some ways built into there is, and this was explicitly endorsed in Plato, is sort of an ethical idea that sort of we should associate more with uh, the mind. I mean, like Socrates seemed to think, um, and Plato, I assume, seemed to think that, you know, uh, s- philosophers were just practicing to be good in the afterlife because you're trying to separate yourself from the body. And we shouldn't yeah. do a lot of bodily stuff and have a lot of bodily sensations because that just rivets us to this awful thing, the body. Um, I don't know whether Descartes had that sort of like ethical spin on it. Um, but as somebody who was a believer and certainly believed in an afterlife, um, he certainly would have, you know, thought that, you know, that probably the most important part of ourselves is the part that would succeed the body, and um, so is, is the mind. All right, so contemporary 21st century thought, what, what's going on now in this discussion? And, uh, you know, la- last time we talked about a whole lot of the, the empiricists and the Barclays and the Humes and the, the Kants, the idealism. Uh, what, what, what's the, the current uh, kind of discussion going on or the, the biggest, uh, you know, who, 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 who do you follow? Well, so probably the biggest name in, um, in the mind-body problem is a guy named David Chalmers. Um, who um, I guess he's about 10 years older than I am, which is... Um, Australian, right? He's Australian, yeah. yeah. And uh, it's humbling because he's done so much. And <laughs> I've, got, I've only got 10 years to, to, to do a quarter of that. But uh, in a lot of ways, um, I think that what happened um, it's about you know 25 years ago now, I guess, is that um, there was sort of a resurgence of interest in philosophers about um, conscious experience. Um, and in particular, um, I think that there was a long period of time in philosophy where there was just sort of just this acceptance that, like, the brain is the mind, and that's all there is to it. Why don't you guys get over it? Let's look at the science. There's the brain. And when you hit the brain, you hit the mind, you know. Um, and um, I, there have always been discontents, and there have always been people who want to say that there's a soul. Um, but the sort of big surge of interest that swept a lot of people who um, – were not particularly religiously motivated into this sort of thing was this idea that um, brain states, um, as you know, much as we might be able to tell about the mind from studying brain states, there's some things that looks like we can't fully understand from studying brain states. And in particular, it looks like there's sort of something that it's like to have an experience, right? Chocolate tastes like something to me, right? There's a particular smell of that sizzling bacon and mm-hmm. on Sunday morning. There's something about pain that feels a certain way. Study all you want about the brain, and it's not going to tell you anything about how it feels, yeah. right? It may tell you you can actually follow, you know, the nerves and the energy propagating along channels, um, but, like, it's not necessarily going to tell you why it feels the particular way that it does. And so I would say that the contemporary discussion about the mind-body problem has largely be, been reinvigorated by the idea that um, neuroscience and uh, the sort of physical sciences don't look like it's obviously within their grasp to sort of explain these features of consciousness, what it's like to actually be a mind. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned Chalmers. Is what you're describing his contribution, or if you were to summarize, you know, his breakthrough or something that the new new ideas well well, how would you describe that well so i mean i should say that you know um there's two others so the what it's like stuff that i keep saying and what it's like to taste chocolate that comes from a guy named thomas nagel uh and um whose work is um thomas nagel is just one of these philosophers who sees problems and brings them to everybody's attention but 
probably doesn't solve it. Like, you know, <laughs> he doesn't take it much further than that. I think he's a brilliant sort of, he's got a brilliant nose for philosophy. Yeah. Um, Chalmers took, um, I think, some of those ideas and made them much more concrete. And so what I think Chalmers is best known for doing is he's known for sort of articulating what they call the hard problem of consciousness. And uh, he gave this, this is kind of the famous talk that launched his career in some ways. And um, basically what he, he said is, look, there's, there's all sorts of quote-unquote easy problems of the mind. Um, so how exactly it is that, um, you know, we have reflex action, for example. That looks like that's something we can understand how physical things can explain that. How do we store information? Like, so memory probably has a lot to do with storing information and being able to retrieve it. Um, well, we're in a place with computers to where we can kind of understand the physical processes that would be required for the storage and retrieval of information. And computation looks like it's the same way. Um, now, those aren't easy problems, but they're easier problems. Mm -hmm. uh, and he says, you know, so there's a lot of things about our minds that look like we might be able to sort of understand sort of in the same way that we understand them in computers. Um, but it looks like there's something else that we can't understand in this way. And this is what he thinks is the really hard problem. It's basically, how can we actually understand consciousness itself? How can we understand actually sort of the being awake of the mind, um, the actual fact that it feels a certain way? Um, and he thinks that actually as much as you study sort of um, the way in which particular sort of neurons work or the way in which various modules of the brain work, none of those is going to be informative on that hard problem. And using various arguments, I think he's kind of forced people's feet to the fire who would otherwise have just said, ah, science, let science deal with it. Um, he's a very competent uh, mathematician and scientist himself and says, no, it, that, that, no, it won't solve that problem, and yeah. here's why. Does this play into the whole kind of ethics of robotics? And, you know, there's a lot of people out there trying to create human life, create kind of thinking robots. And I, I saw an article the other day that I actually found a little, a little, a little spooky about how the decision-making process might be able to be worked into something where, you know, this is something that I think people are trying to create. They're trying to create people that, you know, now I guess people, is a that's a loaded term, but is this where, d d d does that connect to all this about maybe even the ethics of trying to create something artificial that replicates a human being? Yeah, I mean, it does. So, I mean, depending on your view about what brings a mind into being, um, you're going to have a different view about what artificial intelligence can achieve. Um, so, you know, there are people like, you know, um, you know, John Searle, for example, who believe that no matter how complicated you make a computer, um, you're still never going to have a computer that feels anything. Yeah. And in some ways, that's a relief uh, because it's probably going to be the case that these robots that we create are going to be our slaves. I mean, they're going to be doing stuff for us. And yeah. if they're conscious and they're having feelings and stuff like that, that's <laughs> ethically questionable. Um, so, um, but if our brain is fully responsible for sort of our feelings, and that's really all there is to it is physical stuff, you might ask the question about these robots, why, why not think they're conscious? It looks like they've got everything that they need. They're not wet brains, but like it's maybe functionally similar. So um, there are these related issues with AI. Mm -hmm. They're not exactly the same issues, but certainly your views about one will affect your view about the other. Yeah. Going back to Descartes, substance dualism. Uh, what, 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 what does that mean? Well, so, uh, you know, if you have a, like I, like I said, if you have a view about the afterlife, you've got a view about the mind-body problem. And that view is probably substance dualism. And you can put this in the following way. Um, some people believe that the world is just made entirely out of one type of thing, physical things, right? And um, Descartes thought that, you know, basically the way that physical things were is they were sort of defined by the way they occupy space, right? Um, so um, they're just spatial things. Um, but Descartes thought that that wasn't all the world had in it. Um, the world, he thought, quite obviously had thinking things in it. Right? And that was something essential, too. And you can't get to thinking things from spatial things. They're just two totally separate, different things. Right? And I keep emphasizing this things talk because um, when we talk about substances in philosophy, that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about um, things that can kind of exist on their own. Um, so this table can exist you know, by itself in the room. Um, but like the color of the table you know, it looks like it depends upon the table for its mm -hmm. existence. Like it's, it's a sort of way the table is. Um, tables are, are things. Um, 
our bodies are things. Um, Descartes th- thought that there were things that were minds as well, and basically those are just souls. Um, yeah. So if you believe in a soul, you believe that there's a thing in addition to your body that um, can come apart from your body, can exist on its own, and that probably is responsible for your mental life yeah. and probably your character and your identity and things like that. And um, so um, Descartes took himself to be proving substance dualism. He didn't take it as a matter of faith, even though he did have um, faith. Um, he tried to prove it. Um, and um, by doing that, that's how he kind of, I think, kicked off some of the contemporary philosophy of mind or post uh, Descartes lost yeah. your mind. When we talk about this, the uh, the idea of angels comes to my mm-hmm. mind, and of course, the angels are a yeah a theological belief. Uh, certainly, in my Catholic faith, you know, we believe there are angels and they're in the Bible and all that. It would seem like, if nothing else, a a a a, a non corporeal you know, intellect and will like an angel would be a, a curiosity factor for somebody who's thinking about the, these these issues. Do, do most people, uh, like maybe not even believers, do they keep open the idea that there might be some non-corporeal substances like angels, or is that just, you know, medieval superstition craziness? Or what would what would modern uh, uh, philosophers say about that? Well, you know, I mean, there's plenty of modern philosophers who um, who believe in. Uh, souls, and um, probably who believe in, well, I'm sure there are plenty who believe in angels as well, Um, but, you know, whoever believes in a soul is going to believe, I take it, in the possibility of angels, uh, because, I mean, I mean, although you will, you you can probably make some distinctions that I wouldn't make, but in a lot of ways, angels are just disembodied, you know, souls. Yeah. yeah. Um, And um, the, um, so I I think, I would say that a lot of philosophers think it's important to entertain that possibility, even if you don't believe in it, Uh Um, because it looks like we'd better be able to have, these things aren't just like totally fictional things like unicorns, right? Um, We have a reason for actually thinking about things like souls and angels, and not just because maybe we want to live past death, but it's just hard to see basically how our physical bodies can fully explain the nature of the human experience. Mm -hmm. And it looks as though what's most sort of important to me actually transcends that human body. Um, and, you know, a physicalist um, is somebody who says, no, it's actually all just physical body stuff. Um, but I think most philosophers nowadays at least want to kind of keep in mind that there's this other thing that needs to be explained and that, you know, even if you don't believe in souls or angels, you need to take seriously, you know, this idea so that you can, you know, look at something that maybe needs to be explained by your physical theory. Mm-hmm. Physicalism, you, you touched on that a moment ago. Uh, from a practical standpoint, you know, with my example, my pen or a cup, what, what, what does that mean? That it only has physical quality? Is that, are we going back to something like the empiricists? Or is there a connection there? What, how, what would they say about the physical world? And what does it not have that maybe somebody else might disagree with? Well, so a physicalist, um, I mean, is somebody who, uh, the way I put it, you can define terms all sorts of ways, but um, the way I define it is basically a physicalist is somebody who believes that um, essentially everything that there is in the world can be fully explained, or not fully explained, but can be fully accounted for in some sense by basic physics. That basically once you actually fix the way that things move in space, um, which is essentially what physics talks about, um, you've got everything that there is in the world. That's all there is. Um, and so everything about this pen, everything about this microphone are purely determined by physical features, features that can be described in principle by physics um, or the physical sciences. But, of course, a lot of people agree with that about microphones. What they don't agree about is whether or not that's true of us. Um, and a physicalist says it's true of us, too. It's just a little harder to understand. Um, so... Um, Physicalists, I take it, most of them believe in the same sorts of things as everybody else. They just believe that at the end of the day, there's an explanation for it in terms of the basic physical stuff as opposed to needing to bring in something new like souls. Mm -hmm. Does uh, the the universal things like justice or courage or love or, you know, faith that, that you really can't touch or grab or put in a box, what would a physicalist say about those kind of things? Well, so, um, I mean, I think that, like, in the case of, let's say, um, you know, faith or justice or things, like th- those sorts of things, I think the physicalist is going to say, ultimately, if there is, you know, something that is a just state of affairs in the world, 
that could be fully explained by the physical as well. Um, mm-hmm. If faith is something that humans do uh, have, uh, they sort of, you know, have a certain sort of belief, um, and that can be explained by the physical story too. Um, so Daniel Dennett, I think, famously had a book where he basically claimed that faith was just sort of a byproduct of evolution and can get, you know, all its explanation that you need from that. Um, so, and he's a classic physicalist. So he's going to think that basically all this stuff you can trace back down to, to physics. Yeah. Um, Bertrand Russell uh, died in 1970, so relatively contemporary British, I believe. Is that right? Uh-huh. Um, uh, um, monism is that is that right? Well, how, what what is uh, what is monism? Well, so let me. Um, so, monism is physicalism is a monism. Uh, basically, a monism is any view that thinks that ultimately there's one t- sort of stuff that can fully explain the way the world is, right? Um, so Descartes was a dualist because he believes no, there's not there's two types of stuff, two things, right, that need to be taken into account. There's the spiritual minds, and, the, and the material, or yeah. the yeah, the minds and the bodies. Yeah. Um, so he wouldn't necessarily say spiritual uh, in his philosophical work. He yeah. say, say minds and bodies, yeah. uh, thinking things and bodies. Um, now there's other sorts of dualism. Um, that think that basically there are only physical things, uh, so there's no souls, uh, but nevertheless, some physical things have non-physical features, yeah. right? Uh, so what's a feature? Well, like mass, uh, the weight of something, the shape of something, the color of something, that's a feature of a thing. Uh, the table has mass, shape, and all that stuff. And so do our brains. Um, they have mass, shape, and charges, and stuff like that. But in addition, brains have these um, sort of intellectual qualities um, that constitute the way things feel. Um, This is called a property dualist as opposed to a substance dualist. So a substance dualist believes that there are two types of things in the world. There's things like tables and chairs, and then there's things like souls. The property dualist says, no, there's just one type of thing. There's stuff like brains and tables. But some things have properties that physics can't talk about, Mm -hmm. namely the way things feel. Um, and that's one of the more prop, the more sort of popular views right now, I would say, is this idea that there's this feature of physical things that can't be fully captured by physics. Monism, um, though, doesn't necessarily have to be physicalism. So one way to be a monist is to say everything's just physical. Another way to be a monist is to be like uh, Barclay that we talked about before. Barclay thought everything was just ideas. Everything was just minds, mm-hmm. right? Um, if you think that everything is just an idea in the mind of God, Right, which is at least some people's thought about what Barclay had in mind, um, then you are a monist because you believe there's just this intellectual stuff, this ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, Russell was kind of interesting uh, in that he, and of course, he, this is a guy who changed his beliefs a lot. So what did Russell really believe over the period of time? It's a little tricky. But at least at one point he proposed that sort of stuck into the basic physical stuff in the world, right, in the very basis of physical features of the world is um, the seeds of intellect, right, the seeds of mind. So even when a physicist is studying, let's say, you know, negative charge, um, ultimately negative charge has within it, to some degree, some bit of mind-like stuff, Mm -hmm. right? Um, Why does he think that? That sounds kind of crazy. Well, he thinks that's the only way that it could ultimately build up into minds. So... You might say, if it was all physical, you'd never get, you know, feelings and things like that. Um, So one option is to say the feelings are just kind of stuck on afterwards. Um, And he says, that doesn't sound right. It's probably baked in into the basic feature of the world. Um, And so he, Rossellian monism, is this view that it's not physicalism because he doesn't, at least I don't think it's physicalism, because he doesn't believe that everything's just like the physicists say all throughout. He says there is just one type of thing, but it's this kind of combination of physical and mental and it builds up into creatures like us sometimes, and sometimes it's creatures like tables, depending on how it's combined. Interesting. As I recall, in my very basic study of philosophy, the, the first kind of Western philosopher was a guy named what, Thales, is that his name? That's what people say, yeah. And wasn't he like all about, like everything comes down to water, right? right? And, and so he, was, was he a 
like a physicalist in that sense where he, yeah, I, I don't think he believed in, you know, and again, I guess his claim to fame is he kind of got the Western tradition of, of, you know, philosophy going. And then, of course, Socrates and Plato come after him. Uh, and early on, th there was a lot of focus on the elements, you know, fire yeah. and water and, and earth. And uh, w was this an early form of just trying to explain the world just through the physical world, right? I think that's right. I think so. I think, you know, one way to kind of people look at Thales and they say, well, you know, this crazy guy who believed everything was made out of water, why in the world would you view him as basically the founder of the Western tradition? And that is not the easiest question in the world to answer, but I actually think that the answer is that he thought that basically everything needed some sort of explanation in terms of something fundamental. Um, and so, you know, it turns out, he thinks, um, that things that appear to be different ultimately receive a similar sort of explanation. Um, and so, you know, uh, Everything appears to be, you know, all sorts of different things like tables and chairs. But actually, if you look, you know, at um, what actually makes them do what they do, he thinks maybe maybe it's something like water that actually because yeah. look at what water does. Water gets hard um, like ice. Um, it gets, you know, gaseous. Right. It, it can be wet. Um, so maybe by observing those sorts of different states of water, you can say, well, that shows that one thing can actually undergo radical changes and manifest itself in all sorts of different ways. Maybe everything's that way, yeah. right? And water has, you know, sort of the advantage of sort of being a nutrient, and like we pour water on plants, plants grow. And so I think that, you know, kind of leads him to think, you know, that maybe that's the central thing. Now, most people don't believe that water is it, but it wasn't long afterwards that people started talking about things like atoms, like little bitty physical stuff, um, different than the atoms we have in mind now, but um, Democrates thought that, you know, we, you know, had little atoms that made up everything, and there's atoms moving in the void that compose us, and that everything else is just a manifestation of that common stuff. Mm -hmm. And so both of these are actually um, examples of monisms, because they're explaining what appear to be a multiplicity of things in terms of one thing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think that that sort of project, which I think is pre-scientific, but actually manifests itself in contemporary science, you know, that project goes on today, both in philosophy and in science. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I always revert back to Aquinas because mm -hmm. that's, that's the one though, who I've studied a lot. And I think he would say that there's something built into us that ultimately desires God, and uh, that's why uh, there's somewhere in the Summa he says basically it'd be a little cruel for him to uh, have imprinted in us, in his opinion, a desire for something beyond ourselves if it didn't exist. And so I wonder if, I, I think we do differ from the dog or the cat or the grasshopper in that uh, we're not, those animals, those creatures don't seem to be self-reflective. They don't seem to um, think much beyond the, the, the daily grind, you know. So how does that, you know, fit into, not specifically in a theological standpoint, but just it's almost like I don't think many people want to believe that the world is just physical and when we die we, we corrupt and that's the end of it. And so there is a certain longing. Does that, does that play into uh, philosophy of uh, physicalism seems pessimistic? Uh, well, you know, I mean, some people think that and some people— don't. I mean, some people think that physicalism, I mean, they don't, they, most people who are physicalists don't believe in an afterlife. And yeah. so to the degree that that's a bummer, they're going to think that <laughs> they're going to think that that's not so hot. Um, but, um, you know, uh, I don't know that I think that they think of themselves as being pessimistic. I think they just think of themselves as saying, look, a lot of the things that we have over dogs and, you know, like grasshoppers look like they can be explained by things like evolution and physical theory and things like this. And so while I might want to believe in an afterlife, it just doesn't look like this is the sort of thing that has it. Um, uh, you know, on a, on, a, on, a, on a kind of a brief theological note, I know some people who think, boy, it's a good thing that there's no afterlife because an eternal, you know, suffering would be yeah. a hell, right? I mean, that is hell, right? right? And even the slightest possibility of that existing is a real bummer. <laughs> and so I'd really rather just dissolve yeah. it around. Uh, so yeah. some, some physicalists, I think, take that perspective. Uh, you know, that's... You, you sent me a, a bullet point of something that I have absolutely no familiarity with, and that is, by, if I'm even pronouncing this right, panpsychism. 
Yeah, that sounds like a very modern uh, notion. What, what is what is panpsychism? Well, you know, it, it 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 is a modern notion, but actually, you can trace it you, in, in a way. Uh, Spinoza was a panpsychist, according to some people. Um, panpsychism is basically what appears to me to be kind of a crazy view, um, but the idea is is that really mentality is everywhere, uh, and so. So remember, I said that you know Russell kind of thought that you know sort of the seeds of mentality were sort of worked in the very basic of basis of matter, let's say, and when you build it up, you get fully conscious things. Um, there are people, and actually, it's become a fairly popular view. Um, you know, not my house, but like in some people, to say that basically, well, you know, it looks as though if we believe that matter can make minds, um, then why not believe that minds are all sorts of places, right? Um, and if we believe that you need something else to be added to the world to make minds, why well, think it's just here in our heads? Of course, those are the only ones we feel. But like, um, why not think that basically the very basic constituents of the world actually are mental, right? Um, like little minds. Li- in, little in, mi- in, 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 but most people don't believe that they're going to be like little minds thinking, thinking, oh boy, the life of an atom, wonderful. <laughs> it's more like, um, you know, there's just some primitive version of consciousness that's probably on these primitive physical levels. But there's still like consciousness everywhere. Yeah. Um, but nobody would say that a plant is conscious, right? I mean, it doesn't appear to be the case. But uh, an earthworm. I mean, what's the gradation? Well, so a panpsychist might say that a plant is conscious, um, and the parts of the plant are conscious. A panpsychist believes that Awareness. consciousness is everywhere. Yeah. Um, it's just that that type of consciousness isn't um, like ours. It's not presumably as intellectual as ours. Um, you know, I don't personally subscribe to this view, but there are those who believe that, um, that that's the only really consistent take to be made, um, that basically... They, they're kind of following this idea that, like, you should basically think everything's made of the same stuff, right? So um, if the stuff, if everything's made of the same stuff and you get minds here, um, then you should think the minds are all over the place. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I'm not inclined to think that's right, but, like, it's a, at least a way to kind of avoid what they think is sort of not a good view, which is that basically the only things that have this extra sprinkling of minds are these human-shaped creatures. They think that that or, – or animals – they they think that's there's no reason to believe that. Yeah, but they put the minds in only in physical uh, things because you know going back to I was talking about the angels. The angels would be minds, but are they only saying the minds are in the physical? Like uh, the, the I guess that that would be like Russell with monism, right? We got all these little physical uh, aspects. If, I, if I'm understanding that right, yeah, it's, a, it's a it's a fascinating concept to it think is. about all these other little minds because I, I only think of minds as being humans or angels or yeah. God in a sense would be a mind. Yeah. Well, you know, like Descartes didn't think that dogs had minds. He would kick his dog and say, "I love hearing the machinery clank." Supposedly, <laughs> um, but like most of us think that like if you kick a dog. It's going to feel pain, right? Yeah. Uh, and even if it's not sitting there thinking, "Oh my goodness, there's an ethics of pain," it's still like that hurts, right? Oh yeah. Um, so minds are definitely in dogs, it seems, right? And you might think, well, there's really no, and and you know, are they in grasshoppers? Well, these people say um, there's really no reason to cut it off at any particular place. Maybe it just you know gets less less robust as we go down, but it's all minds all the way down. Um, so yeah, that's a. I mean, do they believe in angels? I think some of them could believe in that. I don't, I actually don't know the position of um, the, I mean, so one of the panpsychists who is uh, well known right now is a guy named Philip Goff. And Philip is a believer um, and um, wants his metaphysics to match up with his belief. And so I, I, you know, what he says about angels, I I don't know. I don't, he may, he may or may not believe in that sort of thing. Interesting. Uh, Well, that's, that's uh, absolutely fascinating. uh, This whole, um, idea here. How how would free will play in? If there's a mind, does that automatically? Again, uh, Aquinas would say anything that has intellect has will. Uh, they just kind of go together. Anything that has will loves. You know, they mm-hmm. kind of like one, two, three, boom, boom, boom. Uh, would these minds have free will in the in the in the idea of a, a panpsychism? Uh, I don't know what um, they would say. Um, I mean, the problem of free will is. Um, a really perplexing one that's even, I think, 
um, in some ways harder <laughs> than the mind-body problem, and that like even if there's minds, there's a, and, and even if there's wills, there's a question about whether or not those wills are caused to do what they do by prior causes. Uh, so even if I believe that basically I have a, a soul, let's say, um, there's still this question about you know what causes this soul to do what it does. Yeah. And so you could believe that the world's full of souls without free will, and that's a perfectly consistent belief. Um, and so somebody could be a panpsychist and hold this kind of odd view that basically his mind's all over the place, but there's no free will. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, minds, you know, and it's not crazy to think, I think, in fact, I think it's quite reasonable to think that a lot of the things that our minds do are done for a reason, mm-hmm. prior causes. Um, my answering, my talking now, which is a result of my having mental states, is a result of my hearing you and you're asking me a question. And so there's a causal relationship between you and yeah. me that leads to me talking. Now, um, just because there's a causal relationship doesn't mean I had to do it. Yeah. Um, and But the problem of free will is kind of saying, okay, well, okay, so if there, if I didn't, if I wasn't, ha- didn't have to do it, um, where is this notion of freedom? Like where, uh, that means I'm pretty different than, you know, a sugar cube dissolving in water, which looks like it has to do what it does given the temperature <laughs> of the water. Um, if humans aren't like that, um, what sort of thing gives them that power? And that's, that's, Related to the philosophy of mind, but it's I think brings in a handful of uh, of different issues. Yeah, yeah. I, I think of teleology in a in a Christian sense. You know, God's kind of through providence directing things to their end. Would there you know be a, a teleological uh, aspect to this um, line of thought that things are kind of being directed, whether they know it or not, to some kind of end? Or does that play into it at all? So. Um, Sort of the contemporary free will debate um, tends to have less to do with sort of there being a goal that's sort of drawing things toward it um, and focus more upon the sort of prior causes that lead things to happen. Yeah. So that was actually a big shift away from Aristotelian physics was, you know, Aristotle had this notion of some sort of a final end for yeah. things that they kind of mature towards or move towards. Um and, but he had this other notion of a cause, which was basically the cause that sort of, um, let's say, triggers what happens. Um, so, you know, the reason why the eight ball goes into the pocket is because it was hit by the one ball, which conveyed the momentum to the eight ball. And so yeah. this ball behind the other causes it to do something in the future. And so the explanation of what, why the eight ball went into the pocket isn't the pocket wanted the eight ball. It was that the one ball before the eight ball hit it and <laughs> conferred momentum onto it. And so today's free will debate is much more one ball, eight ball like. It says, look, you and I are just like really complicated eight balls that, you know, there's a lot of spin of environment and genes and stuff like this. But like if you take all that together, that's going to fully explain why we're doing what Mm -hmm. we're doing. Interesting. You have, uh, well, uh, gosh, what, about eight years ago, you wrote a book called Consciousness and the Limits of Objectivity. What was the the thesis? What were you getting at in that book? So basically, I was taking Chalmers on in that book, and um, but also taking on a certain form of physicalist. Uh, so I represent a physicalist position in that book, um, but um, I do think though that there are features of physical systems that can't be fully understood except by being those systems, right? So if you think of like an extreme physicalist as being somebody who thinks. Once you actually study physics, you know everything you need to know about the world. Um, and then you think of a dualist as saying, no, actually, physicalist leaves out, the physicalist leaves out stuff, right, souls or qualities. Um, I kind of occupy a center, a mid- middle space in that I say, no, when you study physics, you don't know everything there is to know about the world. But everything is made up of physical stuff, and if you are a physical thing, there will be something it's like to be that thing. Mm-hmm. And so uh, the idea is is that objectivity is limited and that basically there's not an objective story of the world that's fully complete but nevertheless it's all built out of physical stuff that was the view that i pushed in that book yeah so if you have a kind of like two ends of the spectrum and you have uh, like a hume who believes it's pretty much all ideas right the physical world is just really just representing ideas and then on the other extreme end would you have the physicalist which only believes it, it's all physical and no ideas or would that be too simplistic well most uh, who, people who are who are on the two polar opposites of the spectrum well most people who are physicalists believe that they're ideas um, yeah. they just believe that they're fully explicable in terms of physical processes um, so like if i'm a physicalist i'm not going to just suddenly not believe in thought 
Um, yeah. I mean, there's obviously thought. Um, but they just believe that all there is to it is the story about how the brain works. Um, and so, you know, in a sense, I mean, so it's a little complicated. Those people oftentimes trace their lineage back to Hume in certain ways, uh, even though he was kind of an idealist. Um, but they basically think in a way that Hume kind of thought is that ultimately, you know, you can actually look to the causes of things in order to sort of explain, you know, their appearances and that's all you really need. Mm -hmm. Do you have a, um, inter thank, thanks so much. This has been a very interesting conversation. Do you have a favorite philosopher? Somebody, if you were, you know, cozy up on a cold winter day and have a cup of coffee and just, just dig into somebody who, who would you most, who do you most enjoy reading? Well, I mean, so I, I have to say that, like, I'm more of a, a puzzle guy and that basically I'm more propelled by the puzzles than about than the personalities of the philosophers. Yeah. And so I'm much more interested in their arguments. But, like, um, as far as philosophers who I just enjoy reading and, and feel like I get a lot of personally, I'd list Emerson as among them. I would list uh, Epictetus uh, as among them and some of the Roman Stoic Seneca uh, would be another one. Um you know, those are. I think that those are all good writers that I really kind of enjoy and that feel like they touch on issues that are kind of feel relevant. Um, yeah. And that, and I feel sort of motivated by them yeah. in a way. But that being said, those are the philosophers that have probably the least influence on my actual work because I sometimes don't think their arguments in those areas are all that good. Yeah. Um, we just did two long interviews, and I don't think we ever mentioned Nietzsche. I don't think we ever mentioned Hegel. And I'm glad we didn't mention Hegel. I, I wouldn't have anything to say. I, 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 he's somebody that I try to read, and honestly, I just start to break out in hives. <laughs> oh, is that right? I, just I, difficult I, to read. I find him. I, 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 there's a number of philosophers that I find to be just willfully obscure. Um, just but did, would Kant not fall into that category? He, so I, so I, I think he gets there. Um, but actually, I think that you can usually trace back. You know, to the if you go back to the beginning, of Kant, you can kind of see what he's how he's building up. He winds up with tons of jargon, but you can usually kind of find what that meant somewhere. Mm -hmm. Hegel, I feel like he just kind of comes in with this picture, the talking about like the absolute and the blah, 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 that I just never know what he's talking about. <laughs> he never defines his terms. And, right, um, right. So I'm you think some, he's like a sloppy philosopher? He doesn't, I think that, he's that a very sloppy it? philosopher, yeah. Oh, right, interesting. I, um, so well, he had a big influence because he influenced uh, 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 tons of people. Uh, yeah, Marx. Yeah. I mean, well, there are there are, so there's portions like there's this portion in Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit where he talks about the master-slave dialectic, which is what influenced Marx, and that little bit kind of makes sense. Although, it's it maybe it makes sense. I mean, it's it's sort of like I'm not sure what Hegel was really getting at there, yeah. but like if I think of it in terms of real masters and real slaves, I kind of see how it got to Marx. Yeah. Um, but you know, there's a lot of quote unquote Marxist thought that I find to be just as sloppy that. Not the economic thought, um, but the sort of just what they call dialectical materialism, this sort of, um, you know, the sort of deep philosophy behind it, I find to be really um, sloppy. And, Interesting. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, the philosophy, philosophical tradition that I'm a part of, um, which would call itself analytic philosophy, one of the things that I think that we like to sort of distinguish ourselves in is trying the best that we can to be able to define our terms in clear ways that yeah. people can sort of connect to. And we have our own jargon, too, but uh, one of the famous philosophers that kind of started our tradition, G.E. Moore, said that the most important thing about being a philosopher isn't to be able to come up with answers, but to be able to be really precise about your questions. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of ways, that's sort of the dictum that I It's kind of Socratic, by. isn't it? It and is. That was what Socratic, Socrates was all about? It is. It let, is. Let, me, let, me, uh, and, uh, let, let me wrap up with one, one question, because now that we're kind of scatter shooting and talking about a lot of different sure. people, as we look at you know, 2021, the way the world is right now, there's, you know, it, it's, it's, kind of, it's an interesting time that we're it living is, in right now. For better or worse. I tend to think, without prejudicing your answer, I tend to think that these philosophers that we've been talking about, going all the way back to the, you know, perhaps the pre-Socratics to, you know, modern day, have, have a lot more influence on the culture, even though people probably don't even May, they, they may not, they may have heard the word Nietzsche or Sartre or Hume or but but they don't really know what they are. Who, who, which philosopher one or two do you think is most influencing our culture today, for good or for bad, that maybe people don't realize? Um, I, I don't know. Does that does that make sense or does anybody come to mind where you think that their stamp is on the culture in a big way and not necessarily for good or for bad, but just 
the, the reality. Does did anybody come to mind when you think of that? Well, I mean, it's it, that's this is you know anything I say is going to be a little speculative. Yeah. But um, I mean, there's some philosophers that come to mind. I mean, so somebody who often doesn't get taught a lot in um, colleges, for better or for worse, is a woman named Ayn Rand. Uh, and I think Ayn Rand had a pretty huge impact on certain people, like Paul Ryan, for example, claimed to be a big fan. And um, there's a lot of people sort of in the neoliberal tradition um, that um, I think that she's had. Well, Rand a, Paul was named after her. And Rand <laughs> Paul was named after right? Yeah. Um, and so there's a libertarian current in yeah. our culture that I think owes a lot to her. And she owes a ton to Kant and Aristotle and Nietzsche as well, um, which she sometimes admits, sometimes doesn't. Um, so I think she's one of them. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, I think Nietzsche actually probably continues to have a bit of an impact. Um, there is a pull, I think, in our culture uh, among at least certain people towards secularization and towards a certain rejection of a particular view of morality mm -hmm. and a real sort of skepticism about that view of morality. Um, and not necessarily a skepticism about the religion involved, although there's that too, but there's just a skepticism about the very existence of good and bad yeah. independent of like power relations. Mm -hmm. And that whole idea kind of goes back to, it actually goes back to Plato, but like it goes back most obviously to Nietzsche who basically said that all the stuff that we call good and bad is just various manifestations of power and people yeah. using their power. And so um, I got to say that Nietzsche has got to be up there too. Um, you know, and both of those, I think there's good, good parts and bad parts about that. Yeah, but, interesting. Um, yeah. Speaking of Ayn Rand, I, I read that she once said, what you need to know are the three A's. Aristotle, Aquinas, and you know what the third A was? I'm not sure. Yeah. Ayn Rand. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> so she put herself in the... the, 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 the so I, the, I, I, she was one of with my... With the giants. She was yeah. one of the ones that actually got me into philosophy. I don't, uh, I'm not a libertarian and I'm not a Randian but um, I'm somebody who believes that she should be dealt with seriously and yeah. thought about in a clear way. And there aren't a lot of female philosophers, at least not famous ones, at least not in, in, in the past. And so she break, broke that mold a little bit. In, she in did. Being a female significant philosopher. She did. She did. Yeah. Um, you know, the, that's changed a lot in the century. I mean, some of our best philosophers now are women. Um, but, um, you know, I think, you know, interestingly, we were talked about uh, – the mind-body problem, starting with Descartes, uh, one of his most influential interlocutors was Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia, oh, really? who actually said, Descartes, you got this problem with the mind and the body. How in the world do they interact? And so uh, she's actually considered to be one and of And that's the, when the light bulb went on, yeah, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's supposed to be one of the few, uh, she's kind of one of the few early exemplars of, um, of women philosophers. Well, I better wrap this up or I'll be, I'll be keeping you uh, all, all day. So uh, thank you very much, Dr. Robert Howell. Again, the chair of the Department of Philosophy over at Southern Methodist University. Really appreciate uh, your time. I think it was very enlightening and very interesting conversation. And uh, thank you for watching. If you have any comments or questions, uh, go ahead and put them in the little uh, comment section below and let's keep talking about these important topics of philosophy. Thank you very much for watching.